אז welcome everybody to the LSEC seminar series. Uh, today we are honored to, honest, uh, to host Ziv Williams. Ziv received his MD from Stanford University and then did his postdoc at Harvard Medical School. And he is now an associate professor and neurosurgeon at the Harvard Medical School. He received numerous awards, among them the Presidential Early Career Award from the White House. And Ziv research is focused on studying neuronal mechanism of cognitive processes such as social behavior and abstract thinking in non-human primates, but also in humans. But his work also focuses on trying to combine basic neurophysiology with clinical neurosurgery. So before we start, uh, please make sure that you are all in mute mode. And I remind you that we, we allow questions during the talk, but also that there will be time for questions at the end of the talk. So without further ado, let's welcome Ziv Williams. Dr. Bay. Uh, is that sharing? All right, so um, yeah, no, thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm very honored to be, to be invited. Um, so, um, uh, so today I thought I'll talk about some of the work that we've been doing uh, over the past um, few years uh, trying to understand so social cognition uh, through a combination of uh, animal and, and human uh, models. And so uh, within functional neurosurgery, there's been uh, actually a pretty um, uh, a number of good advancements in our ability to uh, treat a number of disorders such as uh, Parkinson's disease, essential trauma and dystonia. And um, some of the reasons for this is uh, our growing understanding of the molecular and um, uh, uh, circuit-based mechanisms that underlie this, uh, these disorders. And so Parkinson's disease, for example, is a very good e example of this uh, uh, through a combination of understanding of um, uh, dopamine and its role in the direct and indirect circuit, we've been able to uh, uh, target <coughs> um, uh, areas such as the cytomimic nucleus uh, with uh, modalities such as deep brain stimulation. Uh, deep brain stimulation. Uh, and Haggai Bergman, for example, here is, is one of the individuals who's, who's been very instrumental in trying to understand the circuit and, and develop in treatments for this. Uh, but there's still a lot of disorders that we still don't really have a very good understanding of or a very uh, good ability to treat. And these include things like uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, depression, autism, uh, and OCD. And so autism is actually a very good example of this. And uh, to many of us, we have a, a pretty good uh, conception of this. This is essentially a disorder uh, where individuals um, have uh, uh, social impairment. So uh, they have difficulty in uh, relating to others, that pre preoccupation with self, problems with uh, interpreting social cues. And within DSM-5, uh, it really boils down to two <clears throat> main uh, clinical features. These include social communication deficits and repetitive uh, behaviors. Uh, but as you can see, there's still a, a lot of other uh, features and, and um, aspects of this disorder that are disrupted, including language disability, anxiety, and mood disorders. And um, what's striking about this is its, uh, it's um, socioeconomic impact. So over 100 million people in, uh, um, uh, have autism spectrum disorder. And without getting uh, into the debate about how to exactly classify autism. This is a pretty undeniable number. Uh, and um, the annual cost in the United States alone is, is over $100 billion. Uh, but despite this, there, there's still not um, very good treatments for, um, <clears throat> for autism. And so uh, we've been, uh, over the past uh, decade or so, been getting a pretty good understanding of the genetic and synaptic molecular mechanisms behind autism. Uh, spectrum disorder, but uh, despite this, there, there's still not a really good understanding of what are the neural encoding mechanisms that are disrupted um, by this disorder. And uh, there's also very little understanding of how these mechanisms truly relate to uh, disrupted social behavior. So this, um, <clears throat> so th there's been a pretty good um, uh, uh, and growing understanding of the genetic and epigenetic mechanisms that, that contribute to this disorder. And among these, uh, Shank 3 on chromosome 22 is, is one of the genes that's been most commonly associated with this disorder. And without getting into too much detail, it's responsible for this post scaffolding uh, protein uh, that's pretty ubiquitous in the brain, but uh, it um, 
primarily involves, uh, among other areas, frontal cortical areas that are thought to be involved in social behavior uh, and have been associated with autism. And um, this, uh, uh, and you can actually knock this gene out in uh, developmental in, in mice and they will actually display uh, disrupted social behavior. And what this model has allowed us to do is to uh, start gaining a pretty good uh, understanding of the molecular and anatomic basis for this disorder. Uh, but there's still not a very good understanding of what are the actual social encoding mechanisms that are involved and how they contribute to normal social behavior, especially uh, in adult animals that can, can uh, behave in which you can do um, social behavioral experiments with. And so to try to address this first question, and this is one of the first things uh, that we wanted to do at the very basic level is to try to understand this uh, and study this question. So we combine these two genetic techniques, and this is these are actually techniques that have been originally developed with Gupin uh, Fang and, and Brett uh, uh, Bois uh, here, uh, that uh, uh, takes two genetic techniques uh, that allows us to essentially disrupt uh, shank the expression in adults and then restore it in real time. And so here basically we use mice in which the PDZ domain, which is the shank three uh, anchoring domain, um, uh, in which it was inverted and therefore produced uh, an essential uh, 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 shank free knockout. And then we use the Crelock system to allow us to invert this in real time in adult animals and restore shank free expression. And so basically to do this, we, we um, um, use two lock sites to essentially create a flock sequence um, and uh, uh, therefore a, a, a shank free knockout. And then we used uh, a, a Cree uh, enzyme uh, to restore it. Uh, so this was essentially um, uh, uh, fused with, uh, with the estrogen receptor when we gave the, the animals tamoxifen, this would release a heat shock protein allowing the enzyme to go into the nucleus, reinvert the PDZ domain, restore shank through expression, uh, and therefore restore um, and, and this would, uh, uh, and therefore restore shank through expression in real time in adult uh, animals. Um, now, the second part of this was to try to follow neural activity as we're doing this. Um, so we use a number of different techniques, uh, including wireless recordings uh, uh, and microelectrode arrays. In this particular case, we did not use uh, wireless recordings, uh, but we recorded from the DMPFC, which is an area that's been uh, proposed to be involved again in social behavior and autism spectrum uh, type pathology. And so we recorded neural activity from these uh, from this area as we were um, uh, in, in these animals that had shen, uh, that were shank three deficient. And so the last part was to try to understand what are the actual uh, encoding features that are affected um, um, by by uh, uh, by shank, shank three expression. And so to do this, we uh, and without getting into too much detail, we created this um, uh, behavioral paradigm where animals were paired. Um, in which we varied these three uh, features across, uh, across uh, different orthogonal axes. So these included the experience valence of the animal. So is the animal experiencing an, or having an uh, aversive or repetitive experience? Uh, the agency of the experience. So this is something that is being experienced by myself or another. And then the partner identity. So are they familiar or non-familiar? We did a number of different controls that I'm not gonna get into, including um, non-familiar controls and other controls. Uh, but basically, um, using this uh, paradigm uh, recording from neural activity, uh, recording from neurons in the DMPFC, we found that uh, many of the neurons encoded information related to the animal's own experience. So this is already known. These are uh, neurons that essentially showed a difference in activity when the animal was having an appetitive experience or an aversive experience or neither. And so this is essentially a very basic peristimulus histogram in RAST for showing this change in activity. Uh, but these neurons displayed very little or no difference in activity when the other animal was having uh, those same experiences. But what we also found is that um, uh, many of the neurons actually did in fact encode information unique to the other's experience. So this is an example of such a neuron. Um, and this neuron displayed a change in activity when the other animal was having an aversive versus an appetitive experience. But at the same time, they encoded very little information about the animal's own experience themselves. And so you can actually look at this at the level of the population. And this is how it looks like. This is for wild type animals. And so for many of the neurons, they encoded information either um, related to the animal's own experience or to the others. Um, and those are about approximately an equal proportion. 
Um, but you can also look at the exact same thing in animals that were shank deficient. So these were heterozygous shank uh, mice. Uh, uh, we term them here. Yeah. And in these particular animals, they, there was an overabundance of neurons that encoded information related to self, uh, but very little uh, or very few of the neurons encoded information related to the other. And so the other striking thing that, that was notable when you looked at this adult of the population is that uh, for the wild type animals, there's very little overlap between self and others. So these neurons either encode an information about self or other, but not both. Uh, but in the uh, shank uh, three deficient mice, there was a complete overlap. So these neurons did not differentiate uh, between self and other. They essentially were not able to encode social agency and so you could see this also at the level of the population. Um, we also did a number of controls. And again, I'm not going to get much into this, but we also asked how do these neurons respond to when you're simply uh, 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 showing them those same, uh, same uh, stimuli, but not in the presence of another animal, or what, what happens when you actually look um, at the experience of another animal based on their, their identity. And so the next question that we wanted to ask is how does uh, this neural encoding mechanism actually relates to disrupted uh, behavior? So to do this, we um, took the same uh, head animals and we restored shank expression in them. Uh, and so this is essentially a synaptosome Western blot. Uh, we wanted to confirm that we could actually increase uh, shank protein in these animals over time. Uh, we also did a number of controls. So we looked at animals <clears throat> in which tamoxifen was given, but which did not uh, have the, the Crelock system, and we confirmed that indeed they did not uh, demonstrate an increase in chanter expression. And so the next thing that we wanted to do is to actually see how does this change in chanter expression relate to behavior. So this is a fairly common um, uh, social behavioral paradigm to assess for sociability. And so what we do, this is called the three chamber uh, assay, and many of you may be familiar with this. We essentially let the animal roam freely between these two possible chambers. One has another animal and one has an inanimate totem. And uh, we essentially asked, does the animal like to hang out more with another animal or not? Um, and this is a heat map of this distribution. And you can actually quantify this. You can ask uh, how much more likely is the animal to hang out with another animal? And this is a, a, an indirect me metric of, of sociability. And so the interesting thing here is that after you gave tamoxifen and restored shank to expression, there was a gradual increase in the, uh, in the sociability of these animals. So this is uh, before tamoxifen, and this is approximately five weeks after. Uh, we also did a number of controls just to confirm that this is not simply a motoric effect, uh, that they're not simply faster or more likely to move around. Um, and we also wanted to ask, well, how does this actually relate to change, changes in neural encoding properties in these neurons in the same DMPFC area? Uh, so we recorded neural activity in these animals uh, as we were storing um, shank expression. And we found that there was um, a, at least a, somewhat of a restoration of uh, the neural encoding properties that we saw before. So over time, uh, this is what we saw before, and this is after tamoxifen we found that there is a restoration of um, or, or an increase in the preponderance of neurons that, that encode information about other uh, compared to self, as well as a distinction between uh, uh, the two. Now, there are some differences between this and wild type animals I'm not going to get into, uh, but it, it essentially suggested that uh, there was some restoration in the ability of these neurons to encode social information normally. So this is the, the, the last question that we wanted to ask. Um, how do these um, interrelate? So is there, a, is there an actual a temporal dependency between change in rule encoding in the DMPFC and, and change in social behavior? So th this actually took an immense amount of time um, by a number of incredibly dedicated students. Uh, so essentially recording and testing these animals on, on almost a day by day basis as we were storing, uh, as shank three expression was, was being restored in these animals. Um, <clears throat> and here, uh, uh, this is uh, essentially a uh, change in behavior over time. Uh, to make this a little bit easier to read, we did this as a, as a, as a ratio of um, uh, uh, in the time that the animals uh, spent with an 
another animal compared to not as a, as a metric of sociability. And what we can see is that there's a gradual increase in the animal sociability over time. So over, over a fairly uh, uh, short time period, this is over about eight weeks. Uh, and at the same, same time, we also saw, we also saw uh, a gradual increase in the proportion of neurons that encoded information about other compared to self. And you can actually look at the, uh, again, at the temporal dependency between these, uh, you can look at the, the cross correlation. And we found that there's about a one week lag between uh, changes in neural encoding and changes in behavior. Uh, we could also do a number of controls uh, to uh, see if this is simply something that you would expect to see over time independently of whether you're restoring shank 3. And so we did this in animals that lack the pre prelock system and we saw that there was no overall difference in behavior or neural encoding. Now, within functional neurosurgery, we're actually interested to know, is this something that we can do um, focally? So um, individuals that are, uh, that are shank 3 deficient in humans or, or you know, in mice, the, this is a protein that's, that's deficient throughout the brain. Uh, but this is not something you can really restore within, within a neurosurgical approach. Um, and so the question that we had, and this is the last question that we had, is can, can you actually restore to some degree uh, sociability in these animals by focally targeting uh, the DMPFC. So again, without getting into too much detail, we, we restored uh, just the ex expression in the DMPFC in, in, in these animals and did the exact same thing. We asked, uh, is there a change in the neural coding properties of these neurons in this area? And we found that there, that there is. And we also found that there's an, a, a change in behavior and an increase in sociability over time. So um, overall, what we think we've been able to do is we, uh, we've identified uh, prefrontal neurons that reflect the social experience of others and, the, and their social agency, so their ability to differentiate between self and other. Uh, uh, study how social encoding by neurons may be uh, potentially disrupted uh, in, in um, individuals with autism-related pathology. And what we think is uh, exciting is that uh, it, it is possible that autism pathology may be potentially restor restorable post-developmentally in real time in adult cortical cells. And, and this is something that, that may not be intuitive. These are animals that have been uh, uh, essentially displaying aut autism re related behavior their whole lives since they were born. And see, so these are essentially adult animals um, uh, in which you're able to restore uh, both neural encoding and, and behavior. Uh, but more, more importantly, we think that we've been able to provide some biologically tenable target for treatment uh, in individuals with, with uh, autism spectrum disorder uh, with potential some translational ability in, in, in humans. And so, um, you know, mice are nice. That there are a lot of things that you can do with, 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 uh, with this animal model. You can uh, look at uh, how genet genetic dysfunction affects neural encoding and how it may relate to, to behavior. Um, but uh, to a certain degree, they don't re really recapitulate uh, the, the complexity of social behavior uh, that, that uh, uh, primates or humans really display. It doesn't really allow us to ask questions uh, like how do we make uh, complex uh, decisions? How do we predict the actions of others? Um, <clears throat> and this is something that we, we commonly see in, in both primates and humans. And so social behavior and social interactions are, are very complex, uh, but economic game theory allows us to uh, distill this into uh, features that, that are amenable to neural analysis. And uh, the prisoner's dilemma game is actually a very good example of this. Uh, and this is a very, a very basic distillation of this. So um, some of you may be familiar with this, uh, with, with this paradigm. And essentially you have two individuals that are playing with each other and they have the options of either cooperating or defecting. And so if they both cooperate, they get a reasonable amount of reward. In this particular case, we're doing this in primates, so they, they get juice drops. Um, but if uh, they both defect, then they get a much lower amount of reward than if they both cooperated. Now, the linchpin here though, is that if the uh, one of the animals defects and the other uh, animal is trying to be a good guy and cooperate, the animal that defects actually gets the highest possible amount of reward and the one uh, that corporate gets the least amount. So this is essentially why it's a dilemma. And so based on this very simple breakdown, uh, 
what you can do is you, uh, uh, what this allows you to do is that um, uh, outcome un under these conditions is contingent upon the intersection between the mutual concurrent decisions of both individuals. So no one decision can really guarantee a particular outcome. And both decisions can be either concordant or discordant. But more importantly, what this lets you do is at the neuronal level, it lets you potentially dissociate information that specifically relates to one's own decision, the other's concurrent decisions, uh, as well as their past responses and, and their outcomes. And so this is essentially what we did. So we had uh, two primates uh, playing a, a version of the prisoner's dilemma game, and they sat side by side. And the key here is that <clears throat> each one of them could, um, <clears throat> could uh, elect to cooperate or defect, but neither one of them could actually know what the other one selected until both made their decisions. And again, we did a whole number of controls uh, to, to make sure that there are no covert cues that, that, uh, that they could pick up on uh, to give them clues to what the other decided. And so here again, we recorded from the DMPFC. Um, and we found that actually uh, quite a few uh, of the neurons uh, uh, responded to the animal's own decision uh, to cooperate or defect. So this is again, again an example of a very similar cystogram raster. Uh, showing differences between cooperation and defection when the animal themselves made that decision prior to their selection. <clears throat> the striking thing here, though, is that we also found that many of the neurons uh, responded to the other animal's yet unknown choice to cooperate or defect. So the, this is neural activity recorded up to several seconds uh, before the other animal actually made their decision. And this shows a dis distinction in activity between when the other animal decided to cooperate in effect. So based on this, the, the next question that we wanted to ask is, at the level of the population, can we actually use this information, even from this fairly limited number of neurons, to kind of quote unquote mind read what the other animal was going to do? Uh, so this is basically neural population activity broken down into the uh, uh, into principal component space, like at the first uh, three principal components. Um, and these are the projection of the discriminant component on the, uh, uh, for the population. And we essentially, uh, again, without getting into too much detail, found that we can actually predict the other animals yet unknown decision uh, up to approximately 80% of, of trials. And so the question is also, well, how, how does this relate to how you can actually, how optimally you can actually predict? And you, uh, you can actually look at the animal's behavior uh, and you can use a number of different approaches, including GLMs, regression tree models, to basically ask, well, based on the animal's past behavior, what is the optimal uh, probability they can actually predict what they're going to do? And so optimally, you can actually pro predict at about 80%. So uh, at a very basic level, these neurons could almost optimally predict what the other animal uh, was doing uh, or was <coughs> going to do. Uh, and again, we did a whole number of, uh, of controls to, to look into other possibilities. Uh, but uh, at the very basic level, these neurons were making uh, uh, some kind of prediction of what, what, of the, what the other animal was, was planning on doing before they actually did it. Now, e even though these data contractions let you answer a lot of you know, very interesting questions, um, uh, there are a lot of questions you can't really address just looking at dyadic interactions. And the interesting thing about primates is they, like humans, they really live in these very large, complex, uh, dynamically interactive uh, groups. And uh, they display behaviors that are really relevant to a lot of economic and, so, and social behavioral theories. Uh, but one of the very interesting thing about looking at um, uh, more than two individuals and looking at groups is it lets you ask a number of really interesting questions about uh, social identity. So who am I specifically interacting with? Um, or things like reciprocity and reputation. So what other individuals are collectively doing and how do, do their behaviors relate to me and my outcome? Uh, and they're also a little bit more closer to mimicking natural stick human interaction. So, uh, so this is, you know, this is essentially what we did. And um, uh, so to, to start addressing some of these basic questions, uh, we had uh, primates um, uh, uh, playing, uh, uh, playing this reciprocity game, essentially, where we uh, had them sit around a rotary table. And at a basic level, essentially, one of the animals could uh, offer a reward to one of the other two animals. 
And so we would call them the actor and these could be the two recipients. Um, but the important part here is that on each individual trial, one of the other animals could be the actor. So in this particular trial, for example, monkey three, maybe the actor and decide to give reward to monkey two. So monkey two may be very happy and may reciprocate reward to that animal. But then monkey one would be kind of ticked off. He was like, wait, what about, what about me? You know, how come I'm not getting rewards? So um, when they're the actor on the next trial, they may give reward to two in spite of three. And so kind of like based on this very simple paradigm, you can start asking these very, very interesting questions about who offered reward to who and how. Um, and so we also did a whole number of different controls to, um, um, to be able to dis dissociate information related to who is giving or getting reward and the specific interactions. We can actually tag them very explicitly. Um, so we changed the reward location, for example, such that either a leftward or rightward movement can actually lead to reward to the same individual monkey. We also changed the monkey's locations to, to disambiguate spatial information. Uh, as, as, we, as I mentioned, we also changed uh, in, in pseudo random manner who, who the actor was. And uh, we did a whole number of controls to, to make sure that the, the animals were actually behaving appropriately. So there are a number of different uh, formal metrics within game theory that you can actually use to quantify uh, runs of reciprocation. We also looked at things like um, uh, tit for tat uh, and win stay uh, lose switch uh, type strategies. And, and we found that the animals actually uh, behave uh, fairly appropriately. So based on this, we, we wanted to next ask, well, what, what is actually happening in their DMPFC as they're, as they're doing this task? And so, um, so we found, as expected, and similar to before, we found that uh, many of the neurons actually responded to information unique to the animal's own experience. So this is a neuron that responded to the animal's own receipt of reward, uh, but it responded, uh, uh, displayed very little difference in activity when either of the other monkeys got reward. But we also found that many of the neurons did respond uh, selectively to when uh, the other animals got rewards. So in this particular case, monkey A was a recorded animal, monkey B and C were the others. Now, we also did a number of controls to, to um, uh, make sure that this was not simply a reward expectancy type signal uh, or a lack of reward by, by self, uh, but I won't get into that uh, in, in too much detail. Um, but what we found, the, the most uh, interesting cell that we found were these neurons that actually responded very uniquely only when one of the animals uh, got reward, but not anybody else. So this particular parasympathetic neuron raster shows a neural activity for a neuron that responded only when monkey A got reward, but not when monkey B or the animal themselves got reward. Now, this is an interesting type of cell. So this is basically what it means is this neuron not only responded to uh, the fact that another animal got reward, but to who specifically got it. And so this is the, uh, this kind of computation is important because it, um, it, it really is necessary for, for social behavior, the ability to uh, not only identify whether anybody else is uh, uh, getting reward or, or somebody else is acting, but who specifically is doing it. So this is a type of neuron that's been theorized for a long time, but hasn't been shown before. Uh, and again, without getting into too much detail, we also did a whole number of other um, number of experiments actually asking, well, are there certain neurons that, that also respond uniquely to who is actually the actor, who is offering reward? And you can actually tag these very unique interactions. You can actually uh, uh, model and decode who is specifically interacting with who and how uh, at the level of the population. Um, and we also did an, a number of controls to ask, well, you know, if these neurons are truly responding to somebody else specifically, would they in theory track them? So would these uh, neurons track uh, these individual animals across spatial locations? So when switching their locations, we actually found that these neurons would track um, those individual animals, meaning that they were not simply encoding the location where reward was delivered. Uh, we also did other controls like having the animals um, uh, play in this non-social environment where they could actually look at each other uh, but not interact and we found that these neurons did not not encode information about the other's identity simply. Um, we also did other non-social con uh, context controls in which they could essentially recapitulate the ex same exact task and where we would yoke all their all their behaviors from a separate session to try to mimic the same be uh, behaviors 
but without other animals and found that uh, these neurons did not really respond under those conditions. Um, we also uh, very briefly did uh, some stimulation experiments to actually ask uh, what, what contribution does this area actually have to these behaviors. And we found that um, it disrupted the ability, the ability of the animals to reciprocate to, to specific individuals, uh, rather simply to any individual. And so again, without getting into too much detail, we did a number of different controls in which we uh, stimulated during different time periods and when different animals were either the recipients or, 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 the, uh, or the actors. So in a very brief nutshell, what, what we think we've been able to do using this is to identify neurons that encode information about specific agents in a group and, and their behavior. Um, and it, it suggests a putative mechanism that could potentially allow individuals to track the social behavior of specific individuals and their interactions within a group. Um, and it provides, a, 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 I think, a primate model that could be used to study group behavior and potentially uh, um, provide an operational framework over which you can, you can start studying uh, these things and their, their translation in, 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 uh, into uh, clinical settings. And so th this led us to, to the very last question. Uh, and so, you know, human social behavior is very complex. Um, and, um, you know, we as individuals are able oftentimes to construct this incredibly complex understanding of, of reality of other individuals, what they're doing, what they're possibly thinking. Um, and we also use language to communicate. So we, we're, we use language like, you know, like I'm doing now, to communicate information about uh, ourselves as well as information about others. And so this is a very simple example of this. So you may hear a sentence such as, you and Tom are drinking coffee at the table. When Tom goes to the restroom, you place his coffee mug under the chair. So based on the very simple uh, sentence, you're able to somehow glue all this information together. You're able to extract information about Tom drinking and coffee and somehow uh, construct this very complex representation of this, uh, of events, uh, what's happening, who's doing what to whom. Um, but also at the same time, I can give you a, a very simple question, like when he returns, where will Tom expect to find his mug? So uh, even though I know the mug is under the chair, I, I can also interpolate and infer that Tom believes the, the, the mug to still be on the table, even though I know that that is not true. So this ability uh, 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 to infer what somebody else is, is thinking uh, and to also understand that what somebody else is thinking or believing may be different from myself um, is called theory of mind. And, and this is a pretty canonical um, social ability and it's, it's important for human ontogeny and development. It's, uh, it's also oftentimes affected in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And so this is one of the things that we wanted to try to also understand. How, how does this actually manifest? What, what are the computational constructs and logic behind this that allow us to, 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 uh, to formulate these very complex and interesting ideas? And so within functional neurosurgery, we actually have the unique opportunity to sometimes record from, from uh, single neurons in the human brain. And so these are individuals that are undergoing uh, procedures for um, cl clinically in indicated uh, medical conditions in which we happen to be recording neural activity in parts of the brain, uh, including areas such as the DMPFC. And so we developed a way that allowed us to stably record from these individual neurons over time and uh, to actually track neural activity and align it to, um, to things, um, uh, to, to, to tasks or to verbal tasks in which we can actually tag neural activity very precisely at a millisecond resolution. Uh, uh, for example, when like when asking a question like where you know does Tom think the pencil is or when does he think the mug is, and so what we did is we used this uh, false belief task. So this is a canonical task oftentimes used uh, to try to study theory of mind, and you can give you know like like I said before a very basic question uh, or a very basic narrative like you and Tom are drinking coffee at a table. Uh, but you can also uh, create uh, using uh, very subtle linguistic manipulations. You can also alter exactly what is it that uh, Tom believes. You can, for example, manipulate in a way where Tom has a false belief or they have a true belief. Uh, you can also test these across extremely richly varied scenarios and themes. Uh, but you can start breaking uh, these very complex uh, processes and thoughts into something that may be amenable to neural analysis. 
And so, so one of the first questions that we asked are, are there certain neurons in the human DMP that, that simply respond to uniquely or engage you know, uniquely uh, when uh, thinking about somebody else's beliefs? Um, and so across a rich, you know, a rich variety of different uh, narratives, we can actually ask uh, commonalities in, in activity. And this is an example of a neuron that responded uh, specifically when the, when the uh, patients uh, were thinking about somebody else's beliefs, but not when they're considering uh, the physical state of reality. Um, but more importantly, we wanted to ask, well, are there some neurons that actually encode information about what somebody else is specifically believing? So you can do something like this. You can give a narrative like you and Tom see a pencil on a desk and after Tom leaves, you, you uh, sharpen the pencil while leaving it in place. You can also give them a narrative like you and Tom see a pencil on the desk. After Tom leaves, you move the pencil to the drawer. Uh, under both these conditions, you can ask the same exact question. You can ask, where does Tom think, uh, where does Tom think the pencil is? So even though the, the question itself is exactly the same, uh, you are able to infer under these two conditions that, that, uh, under, uh, that the, the other's belief is either uh, uh, true or false. And we found indeed that there are quite a few, of neuro, quite a few neurons that uh, responded distinctly based on these variations. Now keep in mind that the exact same question is given and there's no explicit, there's nowhere explicitly stated that, 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 that the patient's uh, or that Tom's belief is true or false. Um, and you can also use a decoding approach to, to, to ask, well, how, how well can the population optimally predict uh, what, the other, uh, uh, what the other was believing? And you could do it with reasonably good accuracy at the level of the population. Uh, you can also do very cool ling subtle linguistic manipulations as well. So you can, you can do things like this. Um, for example, you can say, you and Tom see a pencil on the desk. After Tom leaves, you move the pencil to the drawer as Tom is looking through the window. So based on this very simple addition, you can alter Tom's belief from false to true because Tom's perspective about the state of reality has now changed. Now they understand presumably that, uh, uh, that uh, the um, pencil is truly on the desk. And we found that many of these neurons actually track this, these changes in perspective uh, uh, to accurately uh, encode whether the, uh, whether the uh, social agent was holding a true or, or false belief. Uh, we can also look at other things like, uh, do these neurons actually distinguish between another's beliefs about reality and its actual physical state? Uh, so you can use these model switching approaches to actually ask, well, if a neuron that encodes another's belief, uh, whether it's true or false, can they actually also encode whether the state of reality is true or false? And we found that these neurons are actually fairly selective. They, they don't, they're, they're not simply encoding a true or false uh, state. Um, so, um, so this is like one half of the story. Um, the, the other thing, you know, that's important for, for these and for, I, I would say much of social interactions as well is, is the ability to communicate through language. Uh, and this is also, as I remember at the very start, uh, I, I mentioned that a lot of individuals with autism spectrum disorder also have difficulty in communication and language um, and in interpreting or inferring information from language. And so this is the other question that we wanted to ask. Um, and so um, uh, over, over the last decade or so, there's been a pretty, uh, 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 there's been a growing understanding of the parts of the brain that are involved in, in semantic processing and then trying to understand uh, and then um, uh, uh, accessing uh, semantic information. Now, um, you know, there are certain parts of the brain like the uh, drosolateral prefrontal cortex and temporal lobe that are, that are specifically involved in language, but there's been a, a growing understanding uh, that uh, semantic information is actually broadly represented throughout the brain. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, under certain conditions, we actually have access to uh, one of these areas uh, in the DLPFC that does show activation by, by functional imaging studies, uh, specifically when, when you give individuals uh, linguistic information um, or, or during, uh, during language perception and processing. And so here we can actually ask, well, what is actually happening when somebody hears uh, this type of information? So for example, uh, when the child bent down to smell the rose, how are they actually processing you know, the meaning of the word child or, or smell or rose? 
Uh, how are we actually understanding the, the really complex dependencies between bent, down, and smell? And so uh, within neural linguistics, there, um, uh, uh, there is uh, ways of actually vectorizing uh, the meaning of words uh, through these embedding approaches uh, uh, that uh, uh, take into account these very large, vast language corpora. And let us ask what are actually the, the relationship between individual words and how, how do their meanings interrelate? So for example, when you look at uh, something like rain or clouds, uh, you can interpret those as you know, having some commonality meaning. So rain and clouds may re refer to uh, weather phenomena, for example, whereas things like sister and dad uh, refer to uh, people or, or family members. And uh, so you can actually take these uh, and you can, uh, um, uh, through different dimensional reduction, uh, 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 dimensionality reduction approaches, you can actually ask what are the semantic domains or commonalities and meaning uh, between them. And more importantly, we can actually ask how do neurons respond to these particular meaning representations or semantic domains. And so this is actually a, an example of a number of, um, of neurons that we recorded from, um, from the uh, 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 drosal outer prefrontal cortex. So this is a, a, a neuron uh, that uh, happened to respond very uniquely to, um, to uh, things like aunt, dad, sister, son, uh, so people or family members, uh, but displayed very little difference in activity to anything else. Um, uh, and this is an example of another neuron that responded uniquely to, uh, uh, to behavioral states or, or, uh, or descriptors, so things like happy, afraid, hurt, and good. Uh, but not to anything else. Um, you can actually look at the coincidence matrix of these. You can actually look at how do individual neurons respond to, to specific uh, meaning representations. And this is broken down into, in this particular case, the, the, the nine primary semantic domains that we could extract, extract from, the, from, the, uh, uh, from the words that we gave. And what we find is that many of the neurons uh, or many of the individual neurons in the D, uh, DLPFC actually responded very selectively to these very uh, specific meaning representations, which was which was very interesting. Um, the the other nice thing about um, uh, these embedding approaches is that you can actually take the this uh, this high dimensional uh, uh, these high dimensional representations and you can uh, regress them onto neural activity. You can actually ask uh, how do neurons represent at the level of the population. Uh, these uh, these uh, relationships uh, in meanings or, or these uh, meaning representations. And again, without getting into too much detail, you can actually <clears throat> uh, dimensionally reduce this onto, uh, onto, onto PC and you can actually project the neuronal uh, representations of meaning into this PC and you can actually ask, well, how as a population do I represent uh, the, the, the difference between clouds and dads or, or dad? And you can also use things like an agglomerative hierarchical clustering procedure and ask, well, we, you know, how, they, how are they hierarchically represented within the brain? And so this is an example of, of, of this. Um, we actually use something like a thousand words, I think, and this is just a number of representative words. And this is the dendogram of the neural projections. And you can see that, that some of that actually made some intuitive sense. So uh, for example, um, uh, uh, words like Eugene, Susan, and George would co-cluster together, but they would also cluster uh, closely to uh, 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 words like aunt, dad, sister, and son. So this kind of like makes some intuitive sense, both refer to people, uh, but they're also much close, more closely related to things like animals compared to weather phenomena, which also makes some intuitive sense. Uh, but you can also quantify this uh, objectively. You can actually look at the cophonetic distance between these. So this is um, something that you can actually objectively measure in relation to how people actually communicate language. So how do we actually represent as, as, as we communicate these different concepts? And we found that surprisingly, they're actually fairly closely interrelated. Um, the other nice thing that you can do this is you can actually take um, all these projections, you can collapse them even, even further onto, um, onto these, this two-dimensional manifold and ask how do these, how are these words represented at the level of a population? Um, and this is, you know, this is essentially how it looks like. So you can see um, you know, how dad, aunt, sister, and son relate to other concepts like good and happy or how that relates to uh, uh, loud and sunny. 
Uh, and, and it kind of boils down to this like really interesting conception. There's a lot of in, uh, a lot of theories in, in the literature about um, <clears throat> how we uh, as humans take this really complex information and and, uh, and uh, uh, process it. Uh, but this is essentially presumably how these neural populations represented these different conceptual features uh, as the uh, as the patients were were hearing you know these words coming at them during naturalistic, uh, 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 these naturalistic sentences. Now, the other thing that we wanted to also uh, ask is, you know, presumably when you're listening to, to this information, you're building this, this um, complex representation of all the dependencies and all the relationships between these different semantic representations. So, um, for example, when I hear Sarah paints a drawing of a red tree house in her backyard, somehow I'm able to take like these, you know, very kind of, uh, you know, abstract acoustic and phonetic features, pull them from the air, glue them all together, uh, try to ext uh, extract the lexical meaning of these different uh, pieces of information like paint and drawing, but also de develop this uh, understanding of what is the dependency between all of them. How does Sarah relate to red and treehouse and backyard? And uh, one of the very cool thing about neurolinguistics and language in general, it's, it's very complex, uh, uh, but you can also break it down into very definable elements. So, um, um, uh, so this is an example of a parser that lets you understand what is the, uh, the relationship between Sarah drawing and treehouse. You can also look at specific dependencies. So between uh, Sarah and everything else that's happening in the sentence, and ask questions about how does neural activity, uh, are there certain neurons that will respond uniquely to these different dependencies? And so we're, this is something that we're just starting to do. We haven't, you know, we're just kind of like at the, um, at the start of this, but, but this is, you know, one of the very interesting things that you can do with this, with this kind of information and start to paint a more complete picture of, of how do you build these, these uh, representations of other individuals and, and, and process it. And so um, <clears throat> what I, I didn't do, I'm really bad at it. Uh, so I find that this, this, this is actually an, incredibly amount of, uh, uh, an incredible amount of work that was done by, by a very dedicated and very talented group of individuals. This is actually Ben Granin, who's a, a, who's a neurosurgery resident at our, at our program. This is uh, Mohsen Jamali, um, uh, Raimondo Baz Mendoza. <clears throat> I've done a lot, a lot of this kind of like very, very hard work. Um, but what we think we've been able to do is identify a uh, putative cellular process in the, in the human prefrontal cortex that may allow uh, us to form mental inferences about others and, and their predictive beliefs and demonstrate, I think, that neurons uh, um, or identify neurons that may function to support theory of mind. Um, uh, but I, I'd say probably most importantly, uh, uh, one of the goals was to provide some basic substrate for beginning to understand, you know, how we represent language and, and, uh, and semantic meaning and how we, we, we are able to extract informa complex information to try to understand and from inferences about others, which is really an important part of social behavior and which is often dis times disrupted in, in things like autism spectrum disorder. And um, so, you know, building on this, ultimately, you know, one of the things that we really want to try to do is we want to try to um, uh, use this information to try to develop treatments for individuals with, with, with social behavioral disorders. And I, I'm kind of like condensing all of this into a very, very neutron level density, you know, uh, a nutshell, but, but ultimately, uh, without getting to others, uh, some of the other studies that we've been doing, including uh, using DBS to try to modulate social perception individuals where we're targeting areas like the periocrovectal gray and other areas within um, like this canonical social network, uh, we're, we're trying to use uh, modalities and in individuals uh, in which uh, uh, at our institution, for example, are going epilepsy uh, surgery and have depth electrodes where we can try to modulate neural activity at a very fine temporal scales. Uh, but we also wanna be able to do this in a, in a way that's, uh, that's uh, actually clinically tenable. Uh, and this is an example of a neuropace uh, stimulator uh, where we can actually record neural activity and based on this actually stimulate uh, specific, uh, based on specific neural events. Um, and this is kind of like one of the things that we've been working on and trying to do. But uh, what we, you know, uh, 
I would say one of the things that we've been really trying to do within functional neurosurgery is to, to really develop this, this systematic bottom-up approach, uh, starting kind of like at a very basic um, molecular and genetic level, uh, up to the normal encoding level using both uh, animals um, uh, or mice and, and, and primates uh, to try to understand uh, social behavior. And ultimately, I think our, our goal uh, is to try to understand uh, teenage behavior, which I think is a, is a complete mystery. <laughs> I, I told, I think I told the, the that my son is just turning, uh, just turning 13. So we were actually going to go do his bar mitzvah in Baritz uh, th th this year, but not this year, maybe next year. Um, but I think this, this, uh, this general approach, I think has application more broadly to um, trying to understand other, other disorders uh, such as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, depression, OCD, anxiety, and things like that uh, in, in a more systematic manner. Um, so, um, you know, ultimately this, you know, this cannot be done uh, alone. And we're, we're very lucky uh, here to have kind of like a, just a phenomenal group of individuals in, in both neurology and neurosurgery, uh, in epilepsy, uh, epilepsy care and movement disorders and, and other conditions. We also do psychiatric uh, disorders um, uh, and do psychiatric neurosurgery in patients with, with medically uh, refractory uh, um, depression and OCD and things like that. But, but I'd say probably the, the most uh, fun, uh, for me at least personally, is to just hang out with everybody in lab. Uh, we have such an amazing group of students in lab. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have like a separate office or desk. I just sit with everybody in lab. And, and uh, I just, uh, it, for me, it's a ton of fun. We go out hiking and, and camping and, and other things, <laughs> uh, which is a lot of fun. Not these days, but now everything's being done on Zoom. But this is just a, it's just a complete pleasure to have the, the ability to work with just incredibly inquisitive, just fun individuals uh, who like asking questions about how the brain works. And uh, uh, so for me, it's just a complete pleasure. Uh, but I, I really appreciate uh, you inviting me. Uh, it's, it's really fun uh, to talk to uh, fellow Israelis. <laughs> Um, but okay, to and, uh, let's move to the questions. I can ask a question. Um, so you're showing cells that respond to other kinds of social conditions. Um, are you learning how the brain actually generates these social? Um, representation or like looking at the response is the timing or the relation to the behavior um so say, say that one more time so I, I think i understood your question but uh so you, you're you're showing representations of cells that are related to your task that are also related to social behavior mm -hmm. but but and and you find all kinds of cells to one monkey one, or to the other monkey, monkey. are you is it telling you how the monkey is actually doing how is it computing the social representation oh yeah so how do the, the question is so this is in, in the prime in primates specifically yeah it, it you know it's an interesting question so the you know we, we were looking at a very specific area in the dmpfc and presumably you know this is part of a much broader network um that's involved in uh, you know, generating this information. So presumably you are uh, gathering information from, uh, you know, lower level areas such as, uh, you know, all the way from MT, MST, and LIP, all the way down to the amygdala to form some representation of the other animal. Um, uh, but uh, the, 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 I, I think I understand your question is how are you actually forming this prediction of what uh, the other animal is going to do? And so we, I didn't get into much of this, but we actually showed that some of these neurons are able to track past behavior and past interactions. Um, and so this is likely a, a building on a more general, uh, a generalized mechanism within the DMP, uh, DMPFC for building a model uh, of uh, a predictive model of what some, uh, you know, something may happen based on past events. Uh, but the interesting thing is that these neurons seem to be more dedicated to encoding social information as opposed to just any information. And that's actually one of the striking things that we found in the, in the human DMPFC is that um, it's, it's not purely a social area. There are actually many neurons that were dedicated to just encoding information about the physical state of reality independently, completely of what, what, other, uh, what other individuals believed of it. Um, 
but I, these these neurons are not likely uh, generating a representation, uh, you know, of of you know the whole social system or the the other individual. There, there it's probably a um, uh, you know a processing hub where you're processing all this bottom up uh, or bottom down information and gluing it together to try to build a, a a prediction about what somebody else may be doing. I hope that I hope that answered your question. Can I follow Ziv, Chagai? Okay, what are you doing? Hi, Tomi. Great to see you. <laughs> you speak in Hebrew, I speak in English, you will manage. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, uh, I have a million of questions, but I'll, I'll only ask about right, left, right, left, left, right, left, left, left. Mm. I think you, you cut off a little bit. Uh, can, you, can you say that one more time? What about right, left, asymmetry? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's it. So that's a really interesting question. So th there's actually this um, uh, uh, a number of really interesting studies uh, looking. So when you do functional, so th there are two parts of this. So there's a social domain and the language domain. And so uh, for a long time, there's been, so there's these, obviously these canonical areas like Broca's area and Wernicke's area that if you lesion them, you get a language deficit. Uh, but language and semantic representations are really represented bilaterally within the brain. And there's not as much asymmetry as you may think. Uh, and presumably these um, um, uh, PSTG and inferior frontal areas are, are critical hubs in, in perception and production. Uh, but language is represented pretty broadly. And there's this really beautiful uh, paper by uh, uh, by Huth and in, in, uh, uh, from, from Berkeley showing uh, these semantic tilings across the brain. Now, the interesting thing about social behavior is uh, there is some asymmetry, but you see social representations and TOM type representations in bilateral TPJ, so the temporal parietal junction, for example, as well as the DMPFC. Uh, there is a little asymmetry between when you're talking about uh, so I, I kind of made this really simple, but there's a lot to social representations. There is, uh, there's the agency differentiating between self and other, and then any kind of social reasoning, and then reasoning specifically about somebody else's beliefs, and then attributing some, uh, beliefs to others. And there's, there's been shown to be some asymmetry between the left and the right uh, for that. Uh, but I kind of gave you the very condensed, simplified version. But you, you ask a very, very good question. That, that's absolutely correct. There, there's... There is, a, there is some asymmetry there. Yeah. Um, a question? So um, this might be a little too obvious, but uh, take into account that I'm a student, so uh, bear with me. No um, how can we actually differentiate between, when we talk about uh, linguistic representation, how can we actually differentiate between uh, representing the semantics as a word that said, the signify and the signified, meaning to actually say that we we are representing the word as a signifier. For example, word to vec takes over some kind of um, uh, an average over the occurrences of the word and it gives some kind of a set fixed meaning. Whereas mm -hmm. in, in, in actual behavior, in actual uh, conversation, sometimes the meaning can deviate from that and actually signify something else. Yeah. So how well do you actually control for that in, in, in your experiment? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm super glad they actually know word to vec, which is like the first key thing. So. Uh, uh, so that's exactly, there, there are all these uh, different approaches for, for uh, um, so basically what, um, you know, what I, I, uh, Itzhak, what Isaac uh, is, is kind of talking about is essentially there are different approaches for trying to take these very vast language corpora and reduce them into this vectoral space that you can actually analyze. Uh, but it's dependent on a lot of things. And what, what they're essentially doing is looking at the word co-occurrence uh, as we're speaking, cat and dog are more likely to be found within the same sentence or sunshine and rain and things like that. Uh, and we're inferring um, semantic similarities based on this. The second thing that I think that you're, uh, but, but you're absolutely right, this may not be how we truly conceive of, you know, uh, of meaning. And every, every person probably has some different conception of meaning. Uh, so one of the very interesting thing about language is you can actually take ambiguities um, things like homophones, uh, where you can actually say the exact same thing. So sun, like the sun rose, <clears throat> or sun as in my son is misbehaving today. Uh, and you can actually, even though the word sun phonetically and acoustically, acoustically is exactly the same, you can actually ask, are there certain neurons that track the meaning of these words independently of their phonetic features? 
And so there's there's very cool ways of actually uh, a answering that exact same question that you're asking. And we actually did that. I didn't I didn't get into that, but we actually had uh, 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 people listen to the exact same things. And we found that these neurons actually track the meaning representations based on how they should be inferred based on the sentence context. The other really cool thing about the neuro, uh, neuro, neuro linguistics is you can actually use the same exact lexical information, but, but uh, alter the semantic uh, representations or, the, um, or the, uh, the syntactic structure of the sentence. You can actually say instead of, uh, um, um, you know, my, uh, the, the child bent uh, down to, to smell the rose, you can say something like, the rose child bent down to. Uh, so even though every word has the same exact lexical representation, the semantic meaning is very different. So you can actually use all these cool manipulations to, to address that exact question. And that, that's kind of like what we've been finding, but, but this is still pretty early work. And we've also been using things like natural language processing uh, uh, models and GPTs that let you actually uh, build a, uh, an explicit model and uh, 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 that uh, represents actually the whole sentence level re representation and the cool thing about like um, deep learning models or artificial neural networks is you can actually artificially cut out layers of, of cut out nodes and actually see how that that affects the neural representations of things. So that was my very long winded answer to your short question. So I, <laughs> but a good, very, very good question. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Can I ask, please? Yes, go ahead. Hi. So I was wondering regarding that the boxy Nice. Um, so when you uh, showed us the, uh, the proportion of neurons that responded to others versus self, it seems like there was some sort of compensation. So the ratio was larger than in the mice that didn't have the knockout. So I was wondering, is that significant? And does it stabilize over time or this compensation remains? I'm really actually, I'm, I'm glad that you actually noticed that. That, that is absolutely correct. And so the, the first, um, the very simple answer to that is we don't know why. Uh, our suspicion is that, uh, so these are neurons that, um, uh, or, or these are essentially cells that have been, you know, quote unquote, socially deprived. So, they're, you know, they've, they've never truly processed social information in a normal way. So all we're doing is we're, we're, we're throwing the postsynaptic post -synaptic scaffolding protein in these, in these neurons. Um, my, 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 my innate sense is that they're, they're essentially hypersensitive to social information at this point. But you're absolutely right. There, there are actually more neurons now encoding social information in these previously shank deficient mice than the regular wild type mice. Uh, at some point, they do normalize. So, some, so at some point midway through restoration, the, the, the ratios are fairly similar to the wild types, but then they go slightly above and then they stabilize over time. We haven't tested this over very long time periods, and it's very possible that after several months, they may kind of revert back to normal, where you can like go get past this like hypersensitivity uh, sensitivity stage. Uh, but th these are crazy hard experiments to do. So these are, I've had students, have, they, they literally counted how many hours we dedicated to doing these like day by day neural recordings and uh, across, I, I think they counted more than like 10,000 hours. <laughs> and at some point they basically just told me to stop. <laughs> They're like, no more. Um, so, but it's a, it's a really good question. We, we don't know ultimately exactly why that, why that happened. Thank you. Okay, Ziv, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. And uh, uh, we all thank you for this uh, talk and you're all welcome for the next seminar next week. My pleasure. Tada, tada, tada.